Good morning, everyone. I began coding when I was in seventh grade. I really had a personal commitment to start the talk that way because I know that no ULI talk has ever started that way. I, I seriously did, and I, I grew up in a family that owned a reasonable amount of, of real estate in the southeast, especially Tennessee, but for a variety of reasons, as the oldest child in my family, I was resistant to going down that path. I really had no intentions to go into tech, but I was good at it, and I really enjoyed it. I uh, had no role models, so there was no sense that that was a career choice whatsoever. I had a pretty strong direction for my parents to become an attorney, and thank goodness that failed. Uh, I did have uh, one strong directive from my father, uh, all his kids did, and that was that we had to pay for our own college. It was part of his own upbringing and one of his core beliefs to, to today, and I certainly wasn't thrilled about it all the time, but it is why I worked on a neural networks project uh, for five years, because I had a fifth year as a, as a fellow. Uh, it was in conjunction with MIT and other groups, and neural networks basically is the precursor to what you guys know of as artificial intelligence. For the people with iPhones and your thumbprint, it was really like the early studies using light waves to figure out how thumbprints could do what they do today. So I went on into my 20s, still resistant to go down the real estate path, and formed several startups, one of which uh, did quite well. At that point, my father and grandfather stepped back in and said, you know, don't blow this. So I went and bought a couple of different portfolios. One of them was uh, single family. This is early 2000s. One was uh, net lease real estate. And fortunately, I really, really hated residential. That was really lucky for me because I sold out of it entirely in 2004 and 2005. Not because I was smart, but I was just lucky and irritated. And I've really stuck with the single tenant component of it. And today I still own some of those assets. They've been great for me. And I learned a number of things through that period, but one of them was that I wanted to get into real estate professionally, but not really the path that my family had chosen. I went and became a broker, really because I felt like if I was trading, if I was in the deals, then I would be able to uh, know kind of like why do things trade for what they trade, and I would have a completely different perspective uh, than my family did strictly owning and developing, which I ultimately got into as well. Um, I tell you all that because to flash forward today, and not to repeat really my uh, intro, you know, I, I own a reasonable amount of real estate, my family and I do. We are invested in a number of tech companies that's new to the family in the last couple of years, and it's primarily CRE tech. One of the things that I began to realize, both on the real estate side and on the tech side, and it was not a uh, formal thesis or Perspect any part of our prospectus, but we were investing, as soon as I took a leadership role in the fund, we've been investing in a ton of female entrepreneurs, uh, and, and people of all, uh, you know, some black female entrepreneurs, a couple that are gay, really nothing, I, again, no thesis around this, this is just sort of what ultimately came to me. And I think it was based on a lot of the experience that I had in the tech world, and to be clear, tech is not getting diversity right either, but it has provided uh, some things today that are useful. And before, I'm gonna show you some stats here in a second, and some slides, but before I do that, it's useful to tell you at b and &E, as she said, we're a net lease uh, brokerage firm. We're using a lot of technology just to be a more modern brokerage firm. On some level, it's like, don't be worried about the tech, it's really just net lease brokerage. We have about half male, female employees. Uh, bizarrely, and again, not intentional, half of our marketing group is male. Uh, half of our analyst team is female. Our head analyst is female. I can't brag as much about our brokers. Um, it's probably a third female, but the most senior uh, broker there besides myself is a woman. Uh, one of the things that I definitely took away from Gosh, CBRE in New York, their leadership, Cushman, uh, 10X, the biggest producers in brokerage, women. Like, there's a lot of money there. 
Let me roll through a couple of stats because I, I didn't start with a business case. That's not who I am. I'm more of an entrepreneur. I run after my instincts, and then where I'm making money, I start to uh, build a thesis. So 23% of senior roles in CRE are held by women. I, I don't know that any of these stats are going to like shake you off your chair. We've seen a lot of these. There are people that are better at discussing diversity than me. Diversity is not. Uh, this is my only talk on diversity. You're listening to it. <laughs> so this is not what I normally talk about. I talk about money. Uh, I talk about tech. But this is useful from a business perspective if you can reverse your normal thinking. About half of the people that are coming up into the ranks in terms of commercial real estate, from the pools of education at the best schools, about half of them are women. Maybe in some cases slightly more. If you can see that that's how many women are in leadership roles, there may be a business opportunity there. There's a void. If you see that there's about the same disparity in terms of pay, 23%, like if you look around, the men around you are making 150 grand and the women are making 115. There's a real disparity. So if you have somebody that you're chasing, somebody you're recruiting for a position, and it's a woman, and you offer her parity in pay, you're wildly more competitive than the other people she's interviewing with. Have you ever thought about it that way? It's a business opportunity. Uh, this one is personal. And, you know, when it goes to uh, raising capital, about 2% of the VC capital out there, I don't know if you can see that on the chart here, but about 2% of the uh, VC capital goes to women. Uh, 1.9 billion of 85 billion. It's, uh, you know, that includes women like Sally Krawcheck. You know, they, they're inclu this includes some pretty rock star banker Wall Street types, and uh, they can't seem to raise any money. So if you're in a pitch, I mean, you could think about it. It could be a development in whatever town you're in, and a female developer comes forward. How likely do you think she is to raise money versus all the male candidates that come to you for you to invest in her company, invest in her project? She's not getting as many looks. She is less likely to raise that capital. Is that a business opportunity? I think it is. And that's what happened. I did not start going after this consciously. I just knew I could make money this way. And, you know, I mean, there are soft reasons to do this, too, that are near and dear to my heart. But if you will put aside all the social agenda stuff that were kind of pushed on us all the time and go back to this like you would any other revenue initiative, the data is on the side of doing this. This is the one that will crush you. This is the worst slide. These are the real unicorns. We all hear unicorn, unicorn, especially in the tech world, thrown around. The real unicorns, the really strange ones, are the 34 black female entrepreneurs that have raised over a million dollars each, ever. That includes Africa. Like, think about it, OK? That's like a horrible stat. And for Tiffany, who was backstage, said, oh, that's, that's better, actually, than it was. And it's true. It was eight last year. It's a really horrible statistic. I can tell you that I have now invested, not because of the stat, just because of all the metrics that lead up to it, in two different black female entrepreneurs. Uh, in the, uh, one is in the fintech space, one is in the edtech space. It's just a, a terrible, terrible stat, but it is a business opportunity. This is another one that you guys hear a lot, and it blows my mind that nobody pays attention to. Companies with the highest percentage of female board directors outperform their competition that doesn't have women on their boards by 53%. What other revenue initiatives that will help you outperform your competition by 53% are you ignoring? You know, all your competitors are going to go do projects in Nashville or Tampa or Whatever it is you do in your core business, you're just ignoring that. That's a stupid idea. Like, this is how to make money. Bring diversity of thought into your leadership. Get your board to have, you know, real dialogue, uh, dialogue among people that have various backgrounds and various perspectives. You would never, in the leadership of a company, have four CFOs leading your company, right? You would pick four different personality types, four different educational backgrounds. Why aren't we doing that when it comes to diversity? And here's the last one. This is one that's near and dear for me that I really love. Um, innovation revenue. So this really means like new projects that you have. 
if right now, you know, again, let's say, because I use Nashville and Tampa, you did a project in Nashville, Nashville has performed really well for your company, and you're thinking, gosh, Tampa, the second largest development in the country is in Tampa, uh, Water Street. You know, is there any way, there's all these opportunity zones there, et cetera, is there any way to get near that? What could I do? There's a lot of tech uh, blowing up there. Those kind of projects, if you get at least 20% of, women, of the managers on those projects to be female, your uh, profits on those will increase by 25%. Again, what other initiatives would you ever dream of ignoring that would increase your revenues by 25%? There aren't, there aren't many. So how do we capitalize on this? I think I've said it you know, to some extent here, uh, but I'll try to break it into four steps. Um, the first one is acknowledge the revenue risk which is really the argument that I'm trying to make today. And I'm trying to give a lot of the people in the room the tool to go, tools to go home and, and make this argument. But you really have to acknowledge that the smartest people, the smartest companies in the room are acknowledging that there's revenue risk if they don't take advantage of the stats that I just showed you in some way or another, if they don't leverage it towards the future goals of their companies and their families. So you've got to acknowledge it. I, and I would go further. You know, again, I don't want to get too caught up in the soft points, but this is a story that means a lot to me. Uh, recently, B&E, we were recruiting uh, a gentleman who had been at one of the most institutional companies uh, that is a member of ULI. Really wonderful fund, uh, national property owner. I, I won't say, I'll, I'll protect the innocent in this, in this story. But it's a group that uh, has a policy of acceptance and is very open. This gentleman had been, let's call him John. John had been at this company for about a dozen years, had left, gone on his own. I've known him for a really long time, began recruiting him, knew he would crush it as a broker, even though he'd never been a broker before. And this company comes back, starts recruiting him again. And from the best I can tell, was offering the same pay they had a lot of things they could offer I couldn't offer, right? Like, I'm a startup. I can promise scale. I can promise options. I can promise a future. They can really lay out a career path in a different way. So I didn't think I would win this candidate. But this candidate came back and told me, Camille, I'm going to go with B&E because I was there for like a dozen years, and although everyone there knew I was gay, you know, white guy, really handsome, knew I was gay, I had to pretend that I wasn't when I was with clients, and I could never have my family on my desk. I couldn't bring myself to work, basically. And I would say in the modern era, and this isn't a millennial, this is someone older than that, in the modern era, era especially with the millennials, you really have to have not work-life balance. You have to have work-life integration. You've got to be able to bring your whole self to work. And I won a candidate that one of the most prestigious members of this organization did not because of their culture. And one of our advisors, Jack Cohen, uh, tells me frequently, culture is more important than strategy. When it comes to economics, when it comes to revenue, culture is more important than strategy. Because here's the thing is that if you screw up your strategy, you guys can all get in a room and within a week pretty much change your strategy. It might be expensive, but you can pretty much control it if you have enough money to. You can't do that with culture. Like it takes a really long time to fix a broken culture, and it will cost you a lot of money. OK, step two, hit this issue head on. And the couple of things that I would say about this are, um, one, and, you know, I would say if you um, have someone who works with you, like, don't hesitate to mention the fact that they're gay. Like, don't, don't, go, don't be afraid to goof up and call them their partner instead of their wife. They would rather it be an open topic. If you're unsure, does the person want to be called black, brown, African-American? Just speak to it. Don't ignore them. Don't ignore that there is a diversity issue. Be humble in the dialogue. But, like, just talk about it and hit it head on. Uh, and also define what diversity is and what it means to your organization. You know, one of the things I would tell you about our board of directors at b and &E that kind of surprised me, again, backed into it, we have eight, uh, eight investors, half of them are women, 
I did not mean to do that. One of them is a person of color. One of them is gay. Again, these are just the people that are in our world. They're all strategics, by the way. None of them are friends and family. And I would tell you that that is so important. We also don't need all women on the board. And I point this out because, again, to protect the innocent, I won't say which one of my startups this is, but one of the startups I've invested in has three female founders. One of them is African American. I thought this is like, I'm a complete stud here. I have found, you know, the, this amazing company. They're enormously talented, great book of business, and they're struggling. And the reason they're struggling is because they're all basically from the same experience, they're all about the same age. Uh, same educational background. They have like too much communication and then too little. They gossip. Um, they don't raise their hand sometimes when they should. And I don't want to make gross generalizations. This is my own company and these three people that I would pick on. But I think it would help enormously if they had another man or two on the executive team. That's what I mean when you need to hit this issue head on and talk about diversity and define these things. Step three, give your team a plan, and also give them the power to make change. You know, I would tell you when I worked at uh, the Stan Johnson Company, had a wonderful group of people that worked with me in HR and recruiting, all women, and they wanted me as a broker to have more women on my team, more brokers, more analysts. We were on the same page. We are on the same page now still. I know they're fighting for that. But I could never have any female candidates, and they would tell me, we just don't have anybody who applied. I'm sure you've all heard that at your companies. No one applies. No one applies. Strange, because it's 50% of the people coming out of college are women that are trained in tracks that, you know, we could hire from. Well, a lot of it became uh, more apparent to me in the last uh, two years, I would say. We became partners with ZipRecruiter. Highly recommend them. Not a good recruiter for every position, but for particular positions, they're an amazing uh, partner in startup. They have a white paper that talks about the language that you use in ads. If you use language like aggressive, competitive, God forbid, cutthroat, you're going to get all male candidates that come forward. When you use words like collaborative, uh, innovative, uh, it, there's a whole group of them you get more diverse candidates. No one told me that. No one told me that. And this is where you need to give your team the questions. You need to give them the power to give you feedback. And we did that with ZipRecruiter, and it, it's really paid off for us. We have much more diverse candidates. And then the step four is measure the results and KPIs. As I try to preach to you guys that this is a revenue initiative, it's not simply a vehicle for social change. They're much smarter and more articulate people that can talk to you about lean in and social change. I can talk to you about money. I would tell you measure the results and KPIs, key performance indicators, like you would any revenue initiative. I really can't make it more simple than that. Measure the results. Set goals. We want to have 20% you know, women in the management by 2020, because that's when statistically things change. Great, you already have that. Get to 30. Measure it. OK, so this is when I saw Sister Solja speak when I was like 19. And she, at one point, said, I'm not talking to any of the white people here, which, of course, was incredibly useful to me as a white person. It legitimately was. I still remember it today. So this is the moment when I turned to the diversity candidates in the room. And that's who I'm talking to, the women, the minorities, all of that. When I was a young buck, and I had joined Collier's, again, to learn all these things about commercial real estate. I went to, it was a setting like this, like an award ceremony. You know, you've got those in January at brokerage firms and hand out the awards. We had this guy, John Dunphy, who was producer of the year, Irishman. And if you remember, it has not been that long since the Irish were on our diverse side of the aisle struggling, and he comes from that kind of family. He won. And he came up, and they gave him the award, and they're like, oh, tell us why. And he wouldn't do it. And they had to pull him back up several times. And he finally said, because I work harder than you do. And everybody in the crowd laughed, because they were talking about us. He's talking about us, right, making fun of us. And he finally came back up there, and he's like, seriously, I don't have, I didn't come from a, man, a family with money. I'm not better educated than you. 
My father didn't give me any leads. We didn't have the language then, but he's basically saying, he didn't come from privilege. He said, I just worked harder than all of you. And this is what I would say to the diverse candidates in the room. I have this up in my office, I have for years, this quote, handwritten on a whiteboard by Billie Jean King. I think you guys know why it was important to Billie Jean to be number one. Just the thing for, for you guys here, for us, you have to prove it. All the statistics that I just showed go out there and there's not like a better thing that I can tell you. Again, maybe some social scientist or some motivational speaker can tell you something I can't. You have to work harder than anyone else that's seeking that job, that's trying to compete with you in that segment. There's not a shortcut. If you have a lot to say and you want to make an impression, then you have to be number one. So I say join me and let's go prove it. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Good morning. So I have a, a question for you. By show of hands, I'm going to need to uh, see who are the good people in the room. Please raise your hand if you're a good person. Good person? OK, good. Thanks, because I was about to have some serious questions. A, a decent enough person, a reasonably OK person for those of you who kept your hands down. Fantastic. All right. Then this is going to be a whole lot easier. So um, as, as the introduction said, I, I wrote these two books, Overcoming Bias and Erasing Institutional Bias, because in my travels around the world, and I've been to, been to six out of seven continents. If you know any, uh, anybody in, in Antarctica who's looking for diversity support, let me know. Uh, I will diversity support penguins if I need to. <laughs> but in everywhere that I've been in the world, I, I generally find that there is a common theme, and that is that people, by and large, fancy themselves decent people. They think of themselves as pretty good people who are trying to do okay by the world. Now, we all know that there are a handful of jerks out there who just really want to torment everybody, but that's not who we're talking about. We're talking about those of us who really want to make a difference and be a little bit better tomorrow than maybe we were yesterday. And so in that, what I find is that th this idea of, of unconscious bias, of the, of the biases that we might have against people or groups that we're not even aware of, it's a really important thing that we take on the responsibility to mine our hard drives and actually address that stuff. Because if you're a good person, which most of you are, there are a handful of you, I'm gonna just pray for you tonight, all right? Um, <laughs> for those of us who identify as good people, trying to make a difference, trying not to cause harm, once you recognize that this, this exists, unconscious bias, right, that you might have, through no fault of your own, locked in on your hard drive things that, are, um, that cause you to treat people less than, treat people poorly, and it's not even something that you're trying to do on purpose, you have a responsibility to do something about that. And it shows up, so the first book, Overcoming Bias, was about how you deal with your individual biases. Erasing institutional bias is recognizing, hey, I'm just one person, but I can see systemic bias operating at a much larger level. And we can see this in all industries, including yours, including real estate, including, including housing. Disparities across racial lines are very, very real. Now, I can tell you that once upon a time, before I was gracing anybody's stage anywhere, I found myself uh, with, a, with an incomplete college degree, a couple of children living in a really awful neighborhood. I did not have a whole lot of money. At one point I was on welfare, domestic violence survivor, on and on and on and on. This, the situation that we have in our country now where we've got people who cannot live in decent neighborhoods because they are that just don't, not economically empowered enough, they're not where they, they might be one day, is really tragic. It is so important that in this industry that you all serve, that we create space for all kinds of people. And often, the reason that we're not creating space has to do with biases, whether in our own minds or that, that serve across the industry. So if we're only creating spaces that serve those with the highest means, if we're not creating space for that missing, missing middle, we're, we are limiting opportunities for children, for families, for people to live their best lives. It took a long time and a whole lot of work to kind of eke my way out of a situation and end up somewhere where I could be in, in a much better place. It took a whole lot of work, but I had to suffer and compromise in the meantime Put my, you know, my children weren't always in the best schools, opportunities were not always abundant, 
and I went from a neighborhood where when, you know, when, when I, my life was under threat because of domestic abuse and I called the police, um, it took them so long to respond that I had to call them back and say, for the love of God, please don't come here because there's a man with a gun who will be inside the house because you've taken so long. I was able to then move into a neighborhood that was diverse in all of the ways imaginable. It had people who could age in place. It had people starting new families. We had gays and lesbians. We had socioeconomic class representation from the lowest rung to the highest rung. Um, you know, right in Richmond, Virginia, and that was fantastic. My child was able to go to a, a Richmond public school that because of that, that integrated um, diversity across the socioeconomic spectrum, public school is actually a really phenomenal educational opportunity for her. But that's because there was, I was able to rent a very nice house at a re reasonable rate within a community that had a whole lot of support. So those of you who have the opportunity to think about placemaking, and creating spaces that are accessible to the least of us. And I, I identify as Christian, among other things, and so what we do to the least of us, it's so important that those of you who have that opportunity, that you seize that opportunity and recognize it is no ordinary task. It's not just another day of doing business. It is a really big freaking deal. What I see in front of me is not just a bunch of men and women in suits. I see potential superheroes, manufacturers and designers of an amazing future in which everyone in our nation can thrive. That is entirely possible because every single disparity that we see in our nation, as particularly those that are attributed to and, uh, and assignable to race and gender and things like that, they've all been manufactured. We, none of us created it. None of us did it but we all inherited these disparities equally. And I believe that we've all equally inherited the responsibility to do something about it. So my invitation to you is that when you have the opportunity to make a choice about how you're going to invest, where you're going to invest, and for whom you're going to create opportunity, I would ask you to be the designers of a new future in which all of us are able to thrive in meaningful ways. This is a future that is possible. With an ever declining middle class, shrinking and shrinking middle class that is living more closer and more precariously on the edge, we need people like you to make these decisions and embrace that human family in a way that we haven't always done really well. It's not an easy thing to do. If you're, again, if you're one of the good people, then it's going to be challenging because you're gonna to have to come up against systems and structures and powerful people who aren't gonna agree with you. But I can tell you, you can find statistics and figures and data to show you the need, and you can find statistics and figures and data to show you that making that change affects a positive outcome, right? So I'm in Richmond, Virginia, where we have like a 25% poverty rate and, and a nearly 40% child poverty rate in our city. Richmond, Virginia has the second highest eviction rate in the country. At one point, we had 17 evictions per day. And I can tell you, I mean, yes, at this point, I've, I've traveled all over the world, I've done a lot of things, and, and life is looking real good. I am hashtag living my best life, black girl magic, up one side and down the other, but I came dangerously close to being evicted in that not so distant past of mine. When I lost a job and I was living paycheck to paycheck, I got the pay or quit notice. I never heard of one, didn't know what that was, and it was absolutely terrifying. Had my lights turned off, all the things. Now I have a doctorate degree, written a couple books, got a couple businesses. It's all good, but it wasn't all good back then. It was all very, very scary. And these are things, these are situations that you know, that, that people, people don't call them on themselves. Nobody deserves poverty. Like, if you want to know the real nitty-gritty about how we got this way, some of this stuff, like I said, was designed to be the way that it is. Like, you guys probably are, if you're not familiar with the history of redlining and how we concentrated poverty quite on purpose using the, you know, using powers and structures in the past in order to keep uh, people of color and keep poverty concentrated. We are still living in those legacies now. We deliberately put highways smack through the middle of black communities and poor communities all over the country. Some people feel like it's you know maybe just their town where that happened. We did it all over the country on purpose. Again, none of us did it, and I ain't mad at you. Now I'll tell you, like this is something I, I like to share with people. Um, I don't want anyone to feel 
some kind of way about the words that I'm saying. I don't want you to feel bad or feel guilty. So on behalf of myself and the three black people that I created, I can't speak for any other black people, but on behalf of myself and my three children, I hereby absolve the white people of your white guilt. If you're carrying that crap around, y'all let it go. Just let it go. Just go ahead and let that go, okay? Seriously, it doesn't serve you. If you feel some kind of guilt or some kind of shame about the state of affairs or anything that anybody says about racism or sexism or any of that, let it go because you did not create it. That said, you ain't off the hook, okay? That said, you do have a responsibility to your fellow human to do what you can to create a better space. Because whether you recognize it or not, each of us has privilege. Privilege is not something that is owned by the white male. Christian, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant, all the things, no. Christian is, uh, um, um, privilege is something that we all have. And I believe that part of the amazing journey of our lives is to figure out what that privilege is and how you can use it. And with what you all do and the levers of change and the levers of economy that you have access to, you have incredible world-shaping powers. I'm talking like pinky in the brain, wah ha 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 right? Big deal world changing powers. If, if people like you took on that responsibility in a big and audacious way, we would be looking at a very, very different structure in a few years. If everyone, and this is the thing, I, I've been working in diversity, equity, and inclusion for, you know, 15 plus years at this point. And I can tell you the amount of self-care that's required to keep my sanity is insane. I got rainbow lashes and crazy fingernails and blue hair just because I got to keep myself entertained to keep myself from getting really depressed and disillusioned. It is hard work. And when you start to stare at it and if you, go, if you really go deep and look into the data, the facts and the figures surrounding your industry, it will give you a headache and it will make you deeply, deeply sad because you're good people and you care about others, right? It will, it will depress you. But what I can tell you is don't look at it as one big giant problem that you can attack. Scale it down to the small things that you can do. Scale it down to the, to the realm of influence that you actually have access to. There are, there are small decisions that you can make probably every single day that will get us closer to a more accessible, more equitable, more global community in which people can thrive no matter where they are. In my city, there are two fantastic organizations that I love, the Better Housing Coalition and Urban Hope. Both of those organizations work really hard on investing in communities and creating accessible, healthy communities. They not only you know, create, like Better Housing Coalition builds spaces and places and communities for people, they also provide resources that help people kind of wrap around services, build their lives in better ways and more intentional ways. Um, Urban Hope is using an impact investment model to leverage people's capital in order to create housing that is accessible for folks. And there's, you know, rent rental opportunities as well as home ownership opportunities. To have like a third of our country, you know, nearly a third of our country is spending like 30% of their income on housing. Um, you know, and that's, that's, the, that's the part of the, peop the people that are actually surviving and doing okay. Those statistics get really, really scary. So again, I invite you to think about what are the things that you can do. And I can tell you that what I have learned is that if you pick up on something, if you're going through the data and you start to really decide to, okay, I'm gonna listen to the crazy blue haired lady, I'm gonna read about our industry, find out whether it's local, national, whatever it is, and figure out what are the things that I need to know about diversity and disparity in this space. If you read something and it really doesn't bother you at all, okay. Right? I'm going to ask you to do the research, but if it doesn't bother you one iota, let it go. I believe, and again, my, my worldview is Christian, but I have all the respect for everybody. I believe that the universe and all the things that be, that there's, a, an, internal, there's an internal calling. When you see something in the news, or you read something, or someone says something, and you kind of want to go, Ugh, it kind of makes you want to throw up in your mouth a little bit, and you get a visceral response, that's the one you act on. That is literally the universe saying, hey, right here, pay attention, wake up, this thing. So when you read it, when you see it, when you experience it, when you hear about it, and your gut goes, oh, that sucks, that's your call to action. Figure out what you can do about that specific thing because you'll have more energy for that than you will for something arbitrary or something less intentional. So 
you know, I, I don't ever have to share my story personally with anyone. I could talk to you about diversity, equity, and inclusion at a macro level all day long, but it's important for me to share with you my own story of nearly being evicted, of being so entirely broke that I had, I think I had $65 a month in disposable income at one point, um, and it was like ramen noodles a lot, right? And this, at this point, I, I had two children when that was going on. I have three now, everyone's good. Um, but it's important for me to share that with you because this stuff is personal and it's real. When you think about, if you, if you have some kind of you know, emotional detachment from the people who, for whatever reason, are not you know, economically advantaged and doing really well, if it feels like something else, something different, it's easy to discount that. But I'm standing here in front of you right now. This is my story, this is real. So my other invitation to you would be, don't look away. We are human beings, but at the end of the day, we're really just animals. Our systems are symbiotic. Y'all know that if you work together with a group of people and you got one person who shows up to work and is like, oh my God, I hate all of you. I don't want to say good morning. Leave me alone. I'm here to collect my check. Go away. Right? You got that miserable human being who's just like, ugh. That drags you down. You don't want to be on a team with that person. You don't want to be on a long drive with that person. You don't even want them to be anywhere near you because that energy is contagious. Also, Sally Sunshine, also contagious, the one who brings the muffins, and she's like, oh my God, it's so good to see you. How's your cat doing today? She can be annoying, she is totally me, but that energy of optimism, that energy of life, it actually brings us up. And the, the main, when you talk about, I love data, data is so delicious, when you talk about data, that energy is, is, is actually contagious. And when you're around positivity and you're around health and well-being, it, it, it lowers your blood pressure. It actually helps you thrive. When you're around stress and you're around anxiety, like what Camille was saying, somebody who doesn't bring their whole self to work is stressed. And the, and the data tells us that they're about, they can be up to 80% less productive because they're having to hide themselves. Right? And that energy of people who have to hide and make themselves small, it affects the entire system. So when you scale that up to a community level, when we create space for our brothers and sisters, at the end of the day, if you can't get behind creating community and building community and making spaces that are welcoming for all of us, if you can't get behind that because it's a kind, compassionate, wonderful thing to do, the right thing to do, the social justice case, whatever, then do it because you're freaking selfish, because it's good for you. It's good for our economy, it's good for you, it's good for your health, it's good for your wealth, it's good for your well-being. It is personally good for you. What you extend to the other comes back to you. A thriving community has less crime. A thriving community has less illness. A thriving community has higher educational levels. Everybody wins. And that's the bottom line. So I love the social justice case. I'm all about it. I believe we should do the right thing because the right thing is the right thing to do for crying out loud. Yes, do it. But like Camille, I'm also a businesswoman. Right? So if you're doing, if it's in the context of your company, we can show you tons of data that will tell you that diversity will help you win. It will help your bottom line. But guess what, folks? It will also help your humanity. It will also, like, uh, like one famous doctor, Dr. Seuss said, it'll make your heart grow three sizes. So I invite you all to join me and to help me on this Herculean task of going forth and being a superhero. Thanks.